Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is Season 1, Episode 13, and today we have Dr. Steven Seiler joining us on the show. Dr. Seiler is a Vice Rector at the University of Ogder in Norway and is commonly referred to as the godfather of polarized training. The polarized training method is used by countless world and Olympic champion endurance athletes. Listen to this episode to learn how the polarized training method can help you become a faster cyclist. Hey, this is just Chris starting out this episode. We had about an hour of Dr. Seiler's time, and because he's covered the basics of polarized training on other podcasts, we wanted to save our time with him for some more interesting, detailed questions on the topic. So I'm going to cover the basics of polarized training here before we get into the show. So what is polarized training? I think it helps to describe the standard threshold training model or five zone system that most people are familiar with to help you understand what the polarized system is. So if you are a cyclist or a runner, there's a really good chance that you've done a threshold test. Uh, If you're a cyclist, you can do a threshold test with a power meter and you'll get a functional threshold power. We've talked about a functional threshold power on this show many other times. And if you have a heart rate monitor, you can do a similar test and get a, a threshold heart rate value. So with your threshold value, you can develop training zones. And Dr. Andrew Coggin has his famous, you know, five zone system that goes from zone one to five, there are zones six and seven, but they're roughly the same as zone five. So most people consider it about a five zone system. And zone one is the easiest and zone five is the hardest. So zone one is your recovery type effort. Zone two is your endurance effort where you may do your long weekend rides or race an Ironman. Zone three is your tempo efforts. That's where you may race a half Ironman. Zone four is your threshold. That's about how hard you can ride for an hour. And zone five are VO2 max efforts, which are very, very hard. And you may only do those for four minutes or eight minutes because of the intensity being so high, okay? So with a threshold model, you're going to spend a considerable amount of your training time in the middle zones, zones three and zone four. Now, with a threshold model, I'm not saying that you don't spend any time in zone one or two or five, but compared to the polarized system, you're going to spend quite a bit of time in the middle, okay, the the zones three and four. The polarized system is different because it only has three zones instead of five. And those three zones sit over top of the five zones. And it's going to vary a little bit for each athlete, but the rough overlay looks like this. Zone one of the polarized system encompasses about zones one and two of the five zone system. Zone two sits over roughly zone three of the five zone system and zone three of the polarized system sits over roughly zones four and five of the five zone model, okay? Where the biggest contrast is between a threshold model and the polarized model is how much time you spend in the particular training zones. So with the threshold model, you're spending a considerable amount of your time in that middle, those middle zones, zones three and four. With the polarized system, you really spend little, if any at all, time in that middle zone two. The polarized system has you spending roughly 90% of your time, your training time, in zone one. So very easy, all easy efforts, 90% of your time, and only 10% of your time in the high intensity intervals um, in zone three of the polarized system. And you really, like I said, no time in zone Two, which the polarized method considers the a, a training black hole or a gray zone, where they say that it's not easy enough to be easy, and it's not hard enough to get the physiological adaptations that you're trying to get with the higher intensity efforts. Okay, so how do you determine your zones one, two, and three with the polarized system? The answer to that is a blood lactate test. So your blood 
or sorry, your yes, your blood has blood lactate in it. It's a it's a a chemical in your body, and most people know it as lactic acid. So if you do some bicep curls in the gym, and your biceps start to burn eventually to the point of failure, that burn is created by lactic acid. Now your body is always producing lactic acid, you know, even at walking, very easy efforts, or sitting on the couch. But until we start to accumulate a lot of it, our body is efficient enough to clear it. And that's only at the high intensity efforts where it starts to accumulate and we can no longer clear it fast enough. That's why the burn happens and that's why you eventually have to stop high intensity efforts, okay? So a blood lactate test is a graded exercise test. And what that means is you start at a very easy intensity and every, we did a two and a half minute interval, but roughly every two and a half minutes, you increase your intensity just a little bit. And at every new interval, every new intensity, you collect a blood sample. We drew it from the ear. You can also do it from your fingertip. And you take a reading with a blood lactate monitor and it measures how much uh, lactic acid is in your blood. So if you plot that, you know, over time versus the intensity or your heart rate, your curve will start out flat. You'll get a jump. Where that jump happens is the, the, the transition between zone one and two. So you jump, then you flatline, and then you jump again. That second jump is the break point between zone two and three of the polarized system. So the first jump is known as your aerobic threshold. Uh, it's also referred to as LT1 or VT1. The second break point is known as your anaerobic threshold or VT2 or LT2. So um, my study will be posted in the, the notes on our flowcycling.com podcast page. You can look at my profile. We will describe this in more detail in the episode on you know how we measure the break points and what the intensities are. So that is the basics of polarized training. So without further ado, um, we're gonna get to Dr. Seiler. He is a true legend of polarized training. He has been studying this for more than 20 years and the best endurance athletes in the world, uh, Olympic gold medalists, world champions in any sport with endurance, rowing, cycling, running, cross country skiing, are using this type of training. So listen to this episode to see how it can help you improve your training. Take care. All right. So Dr. Seiler, welcome to the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. Good afternoon. Awesome. So you're originally from Texas, but you've been in Norway for close to 20 years now, right? Yeah, it's it's over. It's pushing 23 now. Wow. Okay, wow. What cool. part of Texas? And Austin, Texas. Uh, and Austin, Dal- Texas. And also Dallas. Yeah. Love Austin. Awesome. All right. So I, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you on the show today. Um, I've trained in race for years and I, I started with threshold training and you know there's a lot of good principles with that. But when I did threshold training, I found myself stagnating often and I was constantly injured. So there were two things that kind of put me in this roughly polarized way of training and I didn't even know I was doing it. Uh, because I was always injured, I went easy a lot. And just before a race, I did a lot of shorter distance triathlons. I would do these really hard sessions where I found myself doing about 10 minutes of hard work at race pace with two minutes of recovery. I'd repeat that three or four times, maybe three or four times before a race. I found a lot of fitness gains with that and I succeeded. And after that, um, we started flow cycling and we started sponsoring some pro triathletes and train. I started training with them and we'd go out on their long rides and I'd be nervous that I wouldn't be able to keep up and we'd start and I was kind of half wheeling these guys and they'd look at me and go, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, this is, this is a endurance ride and we should be in the zone. And they just laugh at me and they're like, look, we're doing a long ride. The only objective is to ride your bike for a long time. Take it easy. And when I applied that to my training, I got even faster and faster again. Um, so for years, I thought there was something 
about this type of training, but I could never really assign a formula to it. And when I read about your polarized training theory, I think a million light bulbs went off. So um, we got a ton to cover today. I'm super excited to have you on the show. And uh, there are a lot of podcasts out there that talk about your background and the general principles of this, but you wanted to talk about some different stuff today. So I wanted to get directly into the fine details. So um, without further ado, let's start the questions. And can you explain to us what happens physiologically at LT1 and LT2? And my understanding is that below LT1, you're using almost all aerobic ener energy. At between LT1 and LT2, you're using a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic. And then above LT2, you're using purely anaerobic. Is that true? Well, no. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're off to a good start. Awesome. No, right. <laughs> uh, but, all right, let's get started here. So, when we when we exercise and you tar you start working, let's say you're at a really easy 150 watts on the bike, you're spinning in that first intensity zone, that uh, below LT1. If we could go into your to your muscles, we would see that uh, only a certain percentage of all those thousands and thousands of muscle fibers are actually active. A lot of them are just chilling out; they're not doing anything, and and those fibers are not individual they're actually bundled they're in motor units as we could say and so the the first motor units that get turned on are these slow twitch type one motor units you may have heard that term type one yep, yep. Uh, and those are the bread and butter of an endurance athlete more the better to be honest okay uh, but we have three types we have type one we have type two a and we have type 2B. And the type 1 are just purely aerobic. They're just, they're made for endurance, you know, high, lots of mitochondrial, mitochondria, burn fat well and all this. So they don't produce a lot of lactate. Type 2A are more, they're trainable. They can go kind of either way, but with a lot of training, type 2A start to look more and more like type 1. But they are fast twitch fibers. And then the 2B are those explosive fibers that are good for jumping or, you know, getting up a tree if the lion's chasing you and stuff like that. So those are the three basic types. And then as the intensity increases, slowly the brain will recruit of necessity more of these type 2A and eventually, way down the road, type 2B fibers to do the job to produce the work so this mix of, of fiber types plays into the lactate threshold now okay. up until lt1 there's a lot of there's lactate is being produced but it's but it's it's cycling through it's it's not going anywhere or it's immediately entering into either other fibers or being reconverted back uh, so they can be used aerobically. So it's it's a very um, dynamic molecule. Okay. And and it's not accumulating. Okay. It's just kind of it's it's greasing the the machinery in a <laughs> way metabolically. Uh, but once you reach LT one, you start to see an increase in production. You kind of see an increase, like if you were if you turned on the water a little bit more on the in the bathtub. And the drain is open, but if you turn the water on enough, the, there's a little bit of an increase in the bottom of the of the drain, but it's still yep. empty. Well, that's what LT1 you might say is representing, and and but you're still easily able to to get rid of the lactate that's being produced, but there's a bit of a an accumulation, a, that first little increase, okay. And then between LT1 and LT2, as you increase the intensity, you're in this kind of comp compensable range. Uh, that's a big word, but a word where, in other words, the increase in, in lactate production can be compensated with an increase in removal. But the okay. set point keeps elevating. And so okay. the highest lactate concentration that stays constant, or the high, let's, let me rephrase, the highest power output at which the blood lactate concentration stabilizes, that's what we call the maximum lactate steady state. And that's also LT2. Okay. Yeah. 
Perfect. All right. And then above that, that here's where you here's where I said you were wrong. Above <laughs> that, you're still aerobic, but there's a there's a, a bigger contribution of anaerobic energy. Okay, okay. so you're, there's so much anaerobic and lactic buildup, you're you just you, you overdo the system and you can't flush it out. Basically. Yeah, but but let's okay. not overestimate that. I mean, <laughs> even at nine, you know, at ninety five percent of VO two max, I mean, there's a huge aerobic contribution and a relatively okay. small anaerobic contribution. But that anaerobic contribution is is a battery. It, it drains out. You can't. You only have so much. So right. so that's the becomes the limiting factor. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So, so does LT two relate to FTP at all? Well, th this is where things get ugly uh, because uh, <laughs> I, I like the idea of the FTP, okay, the functional threshold power. But the problem is, is that it's anytime you use that word threshold, it implies a distinct barrier that a, a distinct non-linearity that, that is going on. So thresholds apply, you know, when we talk about a ventilatory threshold or a lactate threshold, we can go in and see a, a, a diversion from linearity. We can mark what it is. Hmm. But functional threshold power is just an arbitrary value. Uh, it can be useful, but, but when people keep using different ways to get at it, it's not going to end up being the same. Okay. So, uh, doing a 20-minute test versus a 40-minute test versus a 60-minute test, you're going to get different numbers. Yeah. yeah. And so that's you, one you of know, the big complaints. One. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and therefore, it, that's my problem with it. Okay. Cool. So, before this show, I did a blood lactate profile. Um, I did almost 25 or 30 different blood lactate readings over a graded exercise test. And for anyone listening to this podcast, if you go to flowcycling.com and our podcast page, there will be a link to uh, my lactate profile under uh, Dr. Siler's podcast. So Dr. Siler, you have this and there's a lot of ways that people estimate LT1 and LT2. Is right. One of the ways is to say that at, when your blood reaches 2 millimolar lactate, uh, that's LT1, and at 4 millimolar lactate, that's LT2. Is that the way that you suggest people estimate those values? If, if you don't have really good controlled conditions, then yeah, that's a, that's a, a reasonable way to go. Okay. Uh, but ideally, it, the way we would do it is, is individually. Uh, for example, with your profile, which number one, <laughs> super cool that you took 25 measurements because that's not <laughs> <laughs> that's that's above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, okay, you must like pain. Uh, he should have seen his ear times. after he was done with oh, it. Oh <laughs> man, you should have seen my ear. My, my yeah. girlfriend is patient. <laughs> but, but anyway, that. but it's great because it gives you gives us some some granularity here that we can look at and and it actually reveals some things. So if we start from the start, it's it's good to pick out that you took a resting value. I assume that you had not eaten or done too much, you know, a big carbo uh, carbo uh, crunch right before you took that resting lactate. It looks pretty good at 1.3. Yep. Um, and then we know your maximum heart rate, which you told me was 198. That's correct. So that's useful for the reader, the watchers to know when they're looking at this, uh, this chart. Now, you, you're at rest, you've got a 1.3 millimolar lactate. Now, this is measured with a lactate plus device. That's correct. Uh, I don't know how great those devices are. I assume that the accuracy is good. It uses a really small volume of blood, which always kind of concerns me because uh, that, that means just the, the margin for error is, is, is lower if there's a little sweat drop or anything around it. But, but the data looks good. So, okay. so you start out resting, then you take off with 110 watts, and what's the first reading? It actually, your blood lactate goes down, and that's very typical. Okay. Uh, particularly in a well-trained, you know, a, a well-trained person. Now, your blood lactate goes quite a bit down, and the values, you're, you're under one. Uh, it may be that the, the lactate plus doesn't get the, the lactate in the red blood cells, so probably... If that's true, then these should probably be up adjusted by, say, 25%. But, but okay. it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the, the actual numbers don't matter. What matters is the, the pattern. 
Okay. So your, your blood lactate goes down to 0.6 millimolar, uh, stays down there, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. Um, and then at about 185, 90 watts, then we start to see something going on. And you start to see an increase. So yep. I would say that your LT1 is actually a bit under 2 millimolar. Okay. On this value. I, I hate to I hate to say that to you. I know it always sucks to be told that your power is actually lower than you thought. You're making but, me uh, happy. <laughs> it's so hard to keep my, my wattage there or my heart rate at 136. I'm struggling to do that. In, in the sense that, what do you mean? It's, it's too it's, easy? It's too it's hard? It's too hard. Well, there you go. See, I just made your life better. Dude, because, this is like the best part of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, two millimolar is a bit too high. Your, I would say for you that 190 watts, which corresponds to uh, about one point, you were at 1.3. So you basically have come back up to where you were at rest. And and that's that was what I would call your LT1, and your heart rate is... Um, one thirty, one hundred thirty, one hundred thirty-two, or something. Yeah. So it's a. In other words, you you've been up overestimating LT one a little bit, and, and that okay. can that can make a difference. And then the same thing is happening for you with LT two, uh, because when you use four millimolar, uh, what I see is probably you're hitting your LT two at about two hundred and twenty-five watts instead of two hundred and forty. Okay, because that's the second sp spe or curve. Yeah, that's the change. second point where it clearly comes up. So you, you see, if if you from two twenty all the way up to two sixty, you basically got this smooth increase. You see that? Yep. I, yeah, you're right. And so you just arbitrarily pick off four, and that's that's halfway up that increase. So really, two twenty two twenty five is where I would put you for LT two, and then one ninety for LT one. Well, I got some work to do then by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah, but, but that that is, and this is very typical, that people overestimate their threshold values. It's kind of a macho thing. It's hard, you know. The, it's the equivalent of, you know, doing squats and, and adding weight on the bar but going not going as low, you know. Perfect. <laughs> and you, you keep adding weight on the bar, but you by the time you get to the, you know, pretty soon you're just barely dipping your, your butt. So this is the same thing is that it's tough for people to accept, that, okay, wait a minute, I, I don't have a 300 watt LT2, you know, uh, but it's important if we're going to train at the right intensity. Perfect. Okay. So um, we talked about this a little bit before the show and in your presentation, there's, it's called the hierarchy of endurance needs. Um, uh, and I'll have a link to that on our page as well. And people should read this because it's amazing. Um, but there are, you use percent of VO2 max as an intensity value. And for people who do not have access to a lactate testing facility, so they're rather expensive to buy and to do the test is kind of challenging. Um, and then you also have, you use percentage of VO2 max and a lot of people don't have a percentage of VO2 max value. We talked right, briefly. They haven't had a VO2 max test. Right? Exactly. They don't yeah. have a VO2. Yep. Yeah. So is there any way that people who do not have access to these uh, technologies can estimate their VO, their LT1 and their LT2? Yeah. So what I would do uh, is, first of all, we do need some calibration here. So okay. we need to know the resting heart rate of the subject or of the athlete. Uh, and resting heart rate is just what it implies. It's it, you're still in the bed. You maybe you get up and go pee, then you get back in the bed. You're laying down, uh, and you make sure you're totally relaxed, and you take your heart rate. So okay. that's resting heart rate. Mine is like about forty. And then then you need to know your your max heart rate, and your and I mean your heart rate at max in the modality that you're training. Because it'll be different. Heart, maximum heart rate will be different for running than it will be for cycling or swimming. So if we're talking cycling, then they need to do a cycling test, you know, on their own, really warm up well, 
because uh, that's very important, and then do a progressive uh, kind of almost an interval type session to get up to a max effort that they can sustain, you know, for three or four minutes and just put it, you know, all, you know, to the pedal to the metal and find yeah. that, that, that peak heart rate. So let's okay. say, you know, I'm, I'm, my peak heart rate is, is 170 now, uh, or even a little bit lower. I'm 53 years old. So my resting heart rate is 40. My, my peak heart rate is 170. So what's that give me? That gives me 130 beats of range. Okay. 170 minus 40. If I did the math right, that's 130. Okay. So that means that every 10% of my uh, increase in VO2 is, is associated with about 13 beats of my heart rate range. Okay. Makes sense? Okay. Yes. Yes. So then I say, okay, I want to be at 60% of my VO2 max. And I'm going to assume that my VO2 max happens at my heart rate max. So I'm kind of pegging those two together. I'm not actually measuring VO2, but I'm measuring heart rate. Okay. So I'm going to say, all right, I want to be at 60% of VO2 max, so I'm going to find 60% of that heart rate range. So I'm just going to take 0.6 times that difference, which is 130. So 0.6 times uh, 130 should give us like 78. Okay, yep. yeah. And now I have to add back the 40. Okay. And that gives us, what, 118? 118. Yeah. So 118 beats per minute is going to be about 60%. And that actually f looks really good for me because based on what I – I just happen to know some of my watt values and heart rate values and, and so forth. And it, it makes sense. It, it adds up. So that so, becomes your LT1. So that's no, – that's well, it could be. It could be close. Uh, I would say probably that's reasonably close to my LT1 because when I do low-intensity sessions, I usually end up at uh, about 123, so about five beats higher than that. Okay. So let me – using that formula, my resting – or my MAC peak heart rate is 198, right? So yeah. – and then my resting heart rate – how do you calculate the resting heart rate? Is it an average over the night? Just or No, just take that's, that would be sleeping heart rate. Hell, heck, if I do my sleeping heart rate, it's 32. You know, so, oh. <laughs> so I, start throw, I start throwing arrhythmias at, res, at sleep. I, I've, I've, uh, so I've actually had a halter monitor. So no, you don't use sleeping. You, you, you use an awake resting heart rate. And, and I think the best time to do that is upon waking before yeah, you've got a lot of morning. stress and things. Yeah. But just okay. make sure you don't need to, need to go pee because that'll that'll – raise your heart rate. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. So for me, we've got the 198 and we're going to go with about a 50. Um, so my working range would be 148. Now go. to get to 65% of uh, my VO2 max, I would take the 148 times the 0.65, which gives me 96. And then I add back the 50, right? You got it. So now I'm at 146 beats per minute, but we just said that my LT1 occurs around 130. What do you do in that case? Well, you just, what, what did you, why did you choose the heart rate you chose? You chose 65. Uh, well, we're going yeah, to look. So your, your LT1 is lower than 65%. That's just the bottom line. <laughs> and, that, okay. and believe it or not, that's not unusual. Uh, I, I looked at some data from 43 moderately trained, well-trained or reasonably trained cyclists that uh, uh, Paul Larson did. And, and their LT1 was kicking in at 55, 50, the average was 58%. Of VO2 max. So, oh, okay. So that changes with the individual. Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, uh, it, if, if, it, if it was so easy, you wouldn't need me, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So are then, you, are, so then let that, okay. Let me ask you this then, and then we're going to get into <laughs> the, uh, some finer details. Um, we're getting into the fine details already, but so if, if we've determined that my LT1 occurs around 130 beats and my, other heart, my LT2 occurred around, what was it? One, going back to that, Maybe that document. 156 or something like 156. that. 156. Yeah. With changes in fitness, I get more fit. No, I sorry, get about 
about one. Uh, wait a minute, I messed up here. Probably about one. One forty-five. One forty-five. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, no problem. So with changes in fitness, as I get fitter uh, or I lose fitness, do my heart rates at LT1 and LT2 change or do they stay relatively the same forever? Well, at least within a season, they stay relatively the same within a season. So we've got good studies. Lucia has done a study way back in around 2000 with, with pro cyclists. Uh, I believe Carl Foster did another study where they could show that the heart rate at that particular break point stays stable at least within a season or a year. Okay. So that means you don't need to be testing your threshold every month to, to have good data. Or you know, once you know your, the heart rate at those two thresholds, then you can use those. Now, hopefully what will happen is, is the power output at that heart rate and that threshold will increase. Exactly. Okay. And then um, last question for you on this section. For, so for the people who don't have the lab equipment, uh, how can they estimate the LT1 and LT2? Is there any way with the formula that you just gave us? Yeah. Well, here's, here's where things, this is, this is my spin. This is what I would do if I'm your coach. I would first, if I want to find LT2, or, or, and I'm going to pretty much assume that that's going to be your maximum lactate steady state. I'm going to have you do an hour of power. Uh, okay. It's the classic. And, and I'm going to have you do a one hour ride on your ergometer and just go as hard as you can for an hour. And you will settle in to a power output that will be, uh, it, because you're reasonably well trained, I'm going to have you go an hour. If you were moderately trained, less trained, I'd, I'd probably have you go 40 minutes. But based on the research, we see that well-trained subjects can will be able to handle 60 minutes at their maximum lactate steady state. And it gives a good... So that will give me a, a, a good estimate of your LT2 if you do your job. And then LT1. And how then do we get that? LT1. Now, here's... Uh, <laughs> there's different ways we could go at it. They're, they're all... Um, estimates you know because because we're we don't have all the equipment but one you know we could say well let's take about 70 percent of that 70 to 75 and that's going to give us a good ballpark and then we'll adjust from there perfect uh, cool. perfect oh and then the other thing i would say is that what what i would want to see if i'm if i'm coaching an athlete and i want them to clearly be below lt1 I want to see that that heart rate stays flat during the workout, that it's not drifting up. Okay. Mm. Oh. Okay. One so quick that's, question that's about... One of, the, one of the quality checks I'll make is that, you know, if they're on the ergometer riding for an hour at, at just below LT1, that heart rate should stabilize and stay flat. Okay. Cool. One quick question about testing. Are you familiar or, or do you know of any non-invasive lactate testing that's, uh, that's any good? Not that has has really taken hold. I mean, you you can measure saliva, uh, you know, but not that I am aware of. Uh, you know, okay. I've I've played a little bit with the the cuff around the leg using the NIRS, the non infrared spectrophotometry type of approach. But again, the 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 noise still is not satisfactory. Uh, I would say now I, I want to be shown wrong, uh, but. So far, I, th I still think you got to just do the little finger stick. It's it's not exactly torture. It's not that bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. And the earlobe for me worked a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I want to look at your three zone system and compare it to the standard cog and five zone system. And in your hierarchy of endurance needs, uh, I'm referencing page 26. And I know that your presentation has some animations, but I just kind of want to go over the general idea of how your system overlays with the five zone system so I can ask some follow-up questions. So I'm showing a, a slide here if you're watching the video, but roughly uh, Dr. Shiley, your zone one encompasses most of zone one and two of the five zone system. And then you hit LT1. Now, where that LT1 hits could be slightly into zone three or slightly below it, but we're going to go with around the break between zone two and zone three of the five zone system. 
your zone two, the polarized zone two is about the zone three of the five zone Coggin system. And then that's where VT2 happens. And then from zone four up is kind of your zone three. Is that a fair estimation? Yeah. And and it's really not my system. I mean, this, this is based on physiology. Uh, It's not, magic it's it's uh, or or anything arbitrary it is that we anchor the zones around the physiological points lt1 or vt1 and lt2 or, or vt2 so those are our anchors along with vo2 max which is basically 100 percent so and and alejandro lucia from spain back in late 90s early 2000s did just some wonderful studies on Tour, uh, Tour de France cyclists, you know, the elite guys. And this was the uh, three-zone model that he employed. So I took it from him. Okay. Uh, and, All right. And we'll he clear got that up. it from, from <laughs> others. So this is nothing new. This is uh, really one of the anchors of, of intensity distribution in exercise physiology. Okay, perfect. So now I'm going to reference slide 34. Uh, it's called uh, physiological exposure time. And you're showing um, a lot of time in zone one of the Coggin five zone system, about uh, 80%. And then you've got zone two, there's about 10%, zone three, four, and five. Okay, so these guys yeah, are spending time in zone, right? time in zone. These guys are spending a massive amount of time in zone one. And I think with all the research I've done, this is the, one of the biggest questions I have. So if you look at Coggins five zone system, and I'm holding that slide up, you can just Google that. If you don't have it, it will also be on our podcast page. Coggin defines zone one as anything below 68% of threshold heart rate or anything below 55% of threshold power. So my question is this, we can be on the couch at rest and in theory be below 68% of threshold heart rate. So where is the bottom of zone one? Because if I'm on the couch, I'm not going to get a physiological adaptation to exercise. So where, for a guy like me who has this crazy... I I have a hard time holding 130 on a trainer. I get really tired. So my question is, how low can I go and still get a physiological adaptation? And and again, this is where things get. You know, there is no when you look at, at intensity as a as a unilateral variable, then you get you make mistakes because if I give you a number and I say, well, absolutely 58 percent of VO2 max, that is the lower limit. <laughs> Okay. You know that. Well, that's baloney. Uh, okay. And I have no basis. But if I say to you, probably that fifty-eight percent times two hours <laughs> might be equivalent to fifty percent times three hours, then you start to understand me, right? <laughs> so, it, 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 I would probably not go lower than fifty percent of VO two max as a a training intensity uh, for okay. a, a healthy you know, cyclist training. And, 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 and if you're that low, then probably you're going to be doing it a while. Okay. So then my next question is, um, does where you exercise in zone one have an effect on the level of adaptation? And it sounds like it does. So if I spend, I so, yeah. okay. So if I spend three hours at the bottom of zone one, I'm getting less of an effect than three hours at the top of zone one. Yeah. Uh, and, and and it would and why would that be true? It would be because you're recruiting more muscle at a higher frequency of recruitment uh, at that higher intensity. So you you have a greater metabolic flux, and we think that that's going to influence the signals for adaptation, such as mitochondrial adaptation or capillary adaptation. So yeah, uh, but what we're trying to do is stimulate those adaptations without triggering a big stress response. Okay. okay. So awesome. that's one of the key things that the, the, the elite endurance athlete figures out is that they want to stimulate peripheral adaptations and cardiac adaptations without turning on that big stress response that occurs around from the threshold and above. 
Perfect. Awesome. One thing I've always thought about when you're when you're riding a bike, you know, sometimes you see people that go for long rides um, if they're doing a two hour ride, and then you see somebody that maybe goes out for twenty minutes. The question I have is: Is there a minimum time required for adaptation to occur in a zone one workout? So if I go out for twenty minutes and I'm in zone one, does that really do anything, or do I need to hit like ninety minutes before I get any advantage? I think twenty minutes sounds like <laughs> almost a waste of time. Sounds uh, like John's workout. <laughs> I'm never going to say that training is a waste of time, but if you're g- given that you train quite a bit. If you say, well, I'm going to get out for 20 minutes, then I would almost say, I ah, just screw it and, and do wait till tomorrow uh, you know, and then do a real workout. Uh, right. I would be tempted to say that unless, it, you know, but if it was a 20 minute interval session, then, then that would be different. But if your goal was low intensity, then you should have, in fact, if you go to some of the rowing literature, they use the term extensive training and intensive training. And I, I kind of like that because in the low intensity zone, LT1, you're really extending. That's what you're trying to do is, is think extending the time that you can comfortably perform at this intensity with good technique. You know what I'm saying? That yep. should be the mental focus is can I, comp- can I repeat good technique if I'm a rower, a cyclist, a, a cross-country skier, whatever it is, at this intensity – and what used to be uh, after an hour started to feel uncomfortable, I can now go 90 minutes or I can go two hours. You see, so that's the extension. You're extending. And then the, uh, the, the above LT1, you start thinking about intensive training to handle the intensity. Okay, perfect. Um, I've heard this. Have, have you heard of Maffetone, Phil Maffetone's 180 formula? Uh, no, you can refresh my memory. He, he's a guy who says you take 180 minus your age, and that's kind of your aerobic threshold. You just train below that 180 minus your age. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> so it's... And, uh, I have to just... All of these formulas are so wonderful, but, but they are just estimates. You know, we're all individuals. So I really get frustrated because... <laughs> okay, no, then, okay, that, yeah. So... You know, like, well, let's, let's just take a group of 50 guys guys like your age they will have you have a high maximum heart rate for your age okay. if we were to use 220 minus age you should be at 184 if we were to use 208 times uh minus 0.7 times age you should be at about 186 or something like that one so either way you're above i'm below i'm i'm my maximum heart rate has tended to be low and and the range is like for a given age can be 30 beats so these uh, formulas are good at the population level, but they really are dangerous at the individual level because there will be people that they will miss big time. I mean, the, you know, there'll be 20 beats above or below what, what the formula says. Okay. So, so that's something we really need to get across here. Okay. So one of the things that he said, and I'm, I'm hoping you can bust this myth, but he's saying that if you're doing a, a, a low, a zone one workout, your the polarized zone one he's saying that you're using a specific energy system and if you just break into lt2 even for a short duration 30 60 seconds that you change your energy systems and it has a negative effect on your entire zone one workout is that true uh i have no reason to believe that's true no okay thank you because i didn't like that rule and it sucks if you're <laughs> okay. uh, you know but uh, i will say that that it you know, we do talk about intensity discipline and, you know, it's, it's easy to start drifting up in intensity. So the mental idea of trying to be disciplined and not sneak up into these higher zones is a good idea. But I don't think the one minute in zone two, you know, ob- ob- obliterates the value of the 60 minutes before that. Not at all. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then last question on this section about zone one. Um, is so heart rate is affected by elevation and hydration is our blood lactate or so if if we're if i I live at sea level so if my lt1 occurs at one let's call it 130 and then i go to park city and i'm mountain biking with my friend should i do any adjustments at elevation when using these lt1 lt2 principles well the first thing you should do if you go to altitude is you should 
make sure that the first few rides you do are just easy. Okay. Uh, that, that is just, you know, our basic rule when we take elite athletes up to altitude is that their first at least four days are just low intensity. They don't do anything above LT1. Um, and then after those initial days, they'll start to introduce some intensity. So that's the biggest thing to tell you is just don't go up there and go off on a hard ride because uh, that's a good way to get, you know, dig yourself a hole pretty quickly. Uh, All right, cool. My buddy Brad's listening and then he knows we can't go hard the first few days. Like, yeah, out so, <laughs> so that, that, that's, that's just the rule of altitude training for elite athletes is it's a great way to get in trouble if they go out too hard in those early, early sessions. Okay, cool. Let's cool. jump into zone three. John, go ahead. Uh, LT2 defines the bottom of zone three. Is it safe to assume that the top of zone three is irrelevant? Like, well, is there a, the top is there a max three, top? The top of zone three is VO2 max and heart rate okay. max. So, so right. that's, you know, it's worth knowing that, that max heart rate is max heart rate. And, uh, but having said that, I would say that most of the training, if we look at our best athletes and we look at the intervention studies that we've done, both point in the same direction that the best value for effort, uh, is in that range from just above zone, the, the, the upper edge of zone two. In other words, that transition to say halfway up. So that 87 to 92% range, uh, if we were using heart rate max, you know, doing a lot of work at 90% okay, okay, is, so is that's... preferable to doing a little bit of work at 95%. Okay. So that leads to my next question. We're going to talk about, you do intervals in zone three. So you're saying that the ideal intensity for zone three work is that 87 to 92% of VO2 max? That's what we see is that, that. In the long haul, I, if I'm coaching athletes, I'm going to tend to prescribe longer intervals. I'm going to try to get them where they can accumulate uh, 30 to 40 minutes of work time. Okay. At, and, and they're going to end up, when I make that prescription, they're going to end up around 90% of heart rate max. Um, and if I push them, if, if they push, they try to push harder they'll bog down, you know, and, and so it, it's a natural, when we've done this in intervention studies and prescribed, say, four times eight minutes with two minutes recovery, then that interval session, they'll solve it and they'll end up at 90%. Okay, perfect. Let me ask you this. Um, a lot of times people use power as a measure of intensity because heart rate legs. Uh, is there any way to use power for that intensity Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have the, the luxury of good power measurements, stable, consistent, you know, like you're on an ergometer or, or so forth, then they're great. And, and once you've calibrated, so when I do for myself, like I, I've done some work on the, the ski ergometer from Concept2 and submitted my times and all this. So I have trained a bit. And yeah, I peg a certain power. And I believe for for interval sessions, once you know about where your goal power is, then you should just use power and not heart okay. rate. And is there any way that we can calculate where that 87 to 92 percent of VO2 max is based on the tests that we've done, or is do you have to get your heart rate up there and then see the where the power is? Yeah, that's a good. There's different ways to go at it, but but. I think, for example, what I would do probably is first I would say I would pres give yourself a prescription. Let's say let's say four times eight minutes. Okay. Two minutes recovery. So now I've given you a prescription, and what I'm going to tell you is solve this prescription. I want you to do four interval bouts. Each one of them lasts eight minutes. You get two minutes recovery between. Do them as hard as you can such that the average power for the session is best possible. So what, what's that mean to you? That means don't fly and die. Don't do the first one so hard, <laughs> right? Don't, yeah. And don't start too easy and, and try to bring it all home at the end, but go steady, hard, four times eight minutes. And then find out what, and then, then you're going to zero in on that power. 
and then measure your heart rate. And that interval session will give you a good indicator of where you are. Uh, okay. and, and then you adjust from there. So, so that's what I would do is, is start with a prescription that tends to put people in the right intensity range. And okay. we have pretty good data on that. Okay. And then your intervals, I've heard you talk about four, like four minute intervals, eight minute intervals, and 16 minute intervals. Those yeah. are kind of your recommended ranges to get the time you're looking for? It's, yeah. I mean, there's nothing magic about these times. Uh, okay. But uh, based on everything we know, we tend to favor not doing too much shorter than, than three or four. Uh, and so four, eight, and 16 has just been a kind of a nice symmetrical kind of approach for us. Perfect. And, and we've got very consistent data. We've, we've prescribed these hundreds of times in total. And, and what we, we kind of know what's going to happen. And what ends up happening is, is four times four, it'll put them in zone five. It'll put them in, they, it sucks. It hurts. There's, their RPEs are high. Uh, their blood lactates are like 12 millimolar, 13 millimolar. Uh, if, if we prescribe four times eight, it's tough, but their, their RPEs are a bit lower, say 16, 17, blood lactate's about nine millimolar, uh, and heart rate's about 90%. And then if we put them at four times 16, we're basically going to, they end up being at their maximum lactate steady state. So they're at about, you know, 87, 88% of heart rate max or at about, uh, for cyclists, about six millimolar, five, six millimolar blood lactate, and the RPE is 15, 16. So it's predictable. Awesome. Okay, let's talk about the rest really quick. I've heard you say that uh, two minutes is kind of the sweet spot. Any more than that, you don't get a benefit. Any uh, two, less than that, it's not enough. So two minutes is what you recommend for rest? Yeah, we've, we've, stu- we've published a study on that where we, you know, kind of did it pretty, pretty reasonably, and uh, that's what we found. And so uh, and, and we've been doing it for years. So two to three minutes, you don't really need more in a typical interval session. Cool. And then do those two minutes count as high intensity time or not? No, I would just count w- w- what we tend to do in Norway. It, it, there's different ways of accounting, you know, measuring things. But yep. what we tend to do is called modified time and zone. So if you were to actually take the heart rate data, and plug it into polar flow or whatever you use, you would get time in zone. And and, okay. you, and the time in zone would end up being less than the actual time of the interval. But what we do is we just square off the, the curves. Oh, so, okay. Cause y- so four times eight, we just say that's four times eight minutes in zone four. Gotcha. That's 32 because minutes, zone four. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, you, let's get into building a, a training plan. John, go ahead. If you think about uh, starting polarized training, it could be in a couple different situations. Number one, you're new to a sport, you've not trained before, or you may be coming back from injury. Um, is there any benefit to spending 100% of your time in zone one for a certain time period just to sort of get yourself back in, back in the groove of things before you start adding in zone three work? Yeah, that's a. <laughs> I'm thinking about myself, and and I hated it when I got her injured and and was coming back and everything, and so I know that nobody is going to want to do a whole bunch of zone one for eight weeks. I think eight weeks was maybe something you suggested, but I think the a, a few weeks, two or three weeks of tr- trying to really focus on just getting back that basic rhythm of training is probably a good idea. Uh, I must be an oddball because I I love zone one work and I I came back from injury and I'm actually eight weeks into this type of training and I've done all zone one work. (laughs) Uh, Well, that's great. You know, my problem is I'm the natural interval guy. So I tend to, I (laughs) solve everything with an interval session if I'm not, (laughs) if I'm not, you know, really paying attention to my own, uh, my own research. Okay. So so that's my problem. If you have started a little bit slower, like you've suggested, and you do start adding in zone three work, is there any benefit to gradually adding in zone three work where you're not moving right away to that 20% time? Yeah, well, you just touched on something that's important for us to go into, and that is this 80-20. It has been made pretty, pretty popular. Uh, and like most things that get made pretty popular, it, it becomes partly myth- mythological. <laughs> so uh, 
the original recommendation was based on sessions, counting the number of sessions that were performed with the primary intent of either being low intensity, threshold intensity, or high intensity. So that was the original research that we did, and we said about 80% of sessions, training sessions, should be uh, at low, below the threshold. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, and so, and then we've carefully done studies to show what's the calibration between time and zone, uh, session goal approach, and so forth. And so, if you count minutes with a polar flow or whatever, uh, I'm not trying to advertise polar flow. It's just the one that's coming <laughs> to my head. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, is it's a, you'll end up with about 90% time and zone for a, an 80-20 session distribution. <laughs> ah, that That's makes cool. a lot of sense. Okay, cool. Um, so it's so hard to collect 20 minutes at high intensity. You, you wouldn't, I mean, 20, 20% of time. That, right. that would be, that would cook most people. Okay, so, that clears a lot up actually. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, okay. So, some, some people that uh, have spoken against this method have said that it only works for professional athletes who have endless time to train. And so... Do you yeah, have that's, any- not, that's just not true. I, I got to be honest. That's just not true. <laughs> so we, we've done a number of studies on on sub elite, way sub elite uh, runners and cyclists training in this range of four to seven, eight hours a week, and and we see that it does help. That very typically these athletes are doing just too much training in the threshold range and their, their intensity is loading. is too monotone. Okay, and, cool. So even at four, four hours a week, you're still seeing benefits. Yeah. Uh, but, but, and here's the deal. If, if I'm, if I can only train four times a week, all right. Um, that's a limitation because it would, we, I would probably get better if I could just train more. But given that limitation, let's say it's four times a week and, and I don't know, seven total hours or something for cycling, yep. then what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to at least make sure one of those sessions is long, at least as long as is manageable for me. So that's going to be that long weekend ride and because I, I want to get a lot of zone one. I want to get that extensive training. Okay. Uh, so instead of evenly distributing the time across those four sessions, I'm going to I'm going to front load one of those sessions and try to get it to be much longer. Okay. And then maybe <laughs> two sessions are going to be just hours, you know, 1 hour each on the on the road, and then that third session is going to be a really good interval session using long intervals, getting into that 90% sweet spot and collecting minutes because that's going to be race relevant. Okay. And then because it's 10% of your time, uh, for a guy who's training seven to eight hours a week, he's only looking for 45 minutes of intervals, 40, 30 to 40 yeah. minutes of intervals. And that's, that's exactly what, that's one really tough session. Okay. And that's one a week. That's cool. Okay. That you, you answered my next question perfectly. Uh, okay. So a lot of, a lot of programs talk about a recovery week every three to four weeks. Uh, do you agree with that? And if so, what reduction of volume should you, should you use? Yeah, we, we know some of the studies we've done, we had, we had this huge study on cyclists a couple of years back, three years back now, and we did a four-week, you know, we did 12-week study, but it had three microcycles where we did three up, one down, and, and then tested in that fourth week before we started a new, a new cycle. And, yep. and it kept the guys healthy, and it kept them, we measured their uh, stress and everything, and, and stress went up for three weeks, and then it came back down to kind of normal level in that fourth week. So, yeah, I think that's a good basic rule of thumb is that, you know, you can you can handle three weeks of intensification of the training yep. uh, where you're comparing this week's interval session with last week's and you're trying to increase the wattage. And, you know, you can do that about three weeks in a row, and then you tend to kind of hit the wall. Okay. And so, and then- yeah. Three up, right. one down, and then how much do we drop it? Uh, you know, um, there's different ways to do it. You could just say that week I'm not going to do a high intensity session, or you could say that week I'm going to drop my volume by thirty percent. You know, kind of play it by ear a little bit in terms of what's the stress factor for you and what's your week look like and so forth. 
Okay. So that it, you truly are reducing the stress. Perfect. Uh, polarized training doesn't really have the same base build and peak periodization that you see with a threshold type training. And I've heard you say that things get more polarized the closer you get to a race. Can you just define that briefly? What you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, if we look at the best, you know, our top athletes where we've got lots of really good data on their, you know, pu- push into a championship where they won a gold medal. Um, what we'll see is is that they will be, uh, let's say, you know, in my five zone model, where I take that zone one and break it up into two, and then zone three is exactly what it is is between LT one and LT two as always, and then zone above the LT two, I break that up into two zones, four and five. So that's the way I do. It. I create we create five zones. That's the Norwegian model. Okay. anchored around LT1 and LT2. You with Perfect. me? Yep. So back to the question then. Then what we're going to see is is that as they're approaching a, a championship, they will be even more on the lower end of that zone one, meaning there'll be more zone one, almost no zone two, no yep. zone three. And then the training that typically would be in zone four, some of it will edge up into zone five. Okay, perfect. So perfect. it'll be like it'll go from a lot of zone two and four or one, two and four to zone one and five. Okay. <laughs> if that makes sense to you. That that Ex- would be a polarization of the training as they're approaching a, a championship. Makes perfect sense. And in, and for tapering, is that the same kind of advice you give for people who are tapering? But you, now you're gonna reduce volume as well? Yeah, with tapering the, the work of the, the guys like uh uh uh, Muyika that have really worked on tapering and, and looked at this is the basic model for tapering is is maintain your in t- high intensity frequency, but decrease the number of of bounce so that you know like if instead of four times eight you might do two or three times eight, um, yep. and then yep. reduce volume. Uh, how much depends a bit on. Your what you want and how you you know, but maybe you reduce volume by thirty percent. Okay. So, but but again, we've seen different the way people actually do this depends a little bit on the, the how much how much racing they've been doing. You know, the classic tapering studies have been based on doing one big championship. Okay. Whereas a lot of cycling athletes are racing every weekend. Okay. Uh, so we have to keep this in mind is that the, the tapering process probably is different for the athlete that's doing a lot of racing versus the athlete that's peaking for one big event. Perfect. Okay. And then what's your best advice on pacing? Uh, is there any way to use LT1 and LT2 for pacing? And let's, well, let's look at a short distance race, like a sprint triathlon, an hour ish, and then an Ironman, a full, you know, eight hour, 12 hour day. Well, hour ish is maximum lactate steady state. You know, that's you're basically right on your red line. Um, so you're going to see guys around ninety percent of heart rate for that hour. Okay, uh, that's just the way it's going to end up looking. Um, you know, it's it's tough. It'll drift. So it'll maybe start out at eighty eight, and it's going to be drifting up. And by the time they're going across the finish line, they're at at ninety six. <laughs> yeah, I've been you there. <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> so, but, but the average is going to be around 90, um, for that one hour. And then, um, you said Ironman, well, you know, Ironman, now you're really, you, you've got to be able to, to metabolize a, a lot of fat. You're, you're not going to be able to hold threshold intensity, uh, for eight hours, at least not the average guy. So, so a lot of that work is going to be you know, a little bit below LT or right around LT1, I suspect. Okay, perfect. Um, we're last couple questions before we get to our what point question. Um, how often should we repeat a blood lactate test if we're doing them? Uh, if Again, you, the heart rate is going to be pretty stable. Okay. And if you've got good power measurements, if you're in a situation where you can measure power at home or you've got it on your bike, then probably you, you don't need to do that very often. But if you are in an, an environment 
training environment where you're just having trouble getting the good numbers to, to get some anchor points, then maybe you do it more often. Okay. For, for cyclists, I don't see why it would be necessary to do it very often, given okay, that you have SRM and, and all this stuff. Yep. One of the potential problems that has occurred with some people using this method is that when they start, they're so out of shape that if they're trying to run or if they're trying to ride a bike, that they can't actually do it while staying below LT1. Yeah. What do you recommend for somebody like that? <laughs> Polarize your training. <laughs> I, I, I know that sounds terrible, but the, the fact is, and we've seen this on studies, is we get these guys, these 35, 40-year-old guys that come in, they're gung-ho, they train five <laughs> hours a week, and every ride is just half-wheeling to the max. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, so, and they come in and they've got two and a half millimolar before they put on their skin suit, you know, they, 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 <laughs> and because they just, they end up in this, this hyper, they don't have any metabolic control. And so the first thing we see is, is that if we just, if we just tell them, all right, you're coming in the lab two times a week, you're going to do these tough interval sessions. So by all means, when you're not in the lab, train easy. All right, so that's the first thing we tell them, and what and that all kind of automatically pushes them into this polarized situation because those two sessions for them are tough, and so they end up actually training really easy otherwise, and all of a sudden things start changing. Their their lactate, their resting lactate comes down. They start to to normalize the profile. If we get you know six seven weeks of that, and it it makes a difference. Okay, and that might so, mean walking for runners, right? Yeah, maybe. Or, you know, walking uphill. I, I hope not, but but uh, definitely running slower than they're used to for a little while. Okay, okay, okay. All right, last question. Uh, we ask this to every guest. It's called our Watt Point question. And the idea is if the, the listeners take the advice of the expert on the show, how many watts can they add to their FTP over a season? So we always use an athlete with a 300 watt FTP. So let's assume that that athlete is following a threshold type training plan and then adopts a perfectly prescribed polarized training plan for a season. How many watts do you think they could add to their FTP? Oh, wow. You really put me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> Not an uncommon reaction to this question. I, you know, I'm going to say that if I, if, if you let me train you, I can get five to 10% out of you. Wow. If, if you're if, uh, 5%, I can, I can make a, a 5% difference if, if I can get you to do things in a more disciplined way uh, than 300 goes to 315. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Let me, uh, is there anything, how can users find out more about you or how can we help you out? Is there any pages that we should go or check out? What, what can we do to find out more about you and your system? Well, I, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, I used to say I would never tweet, but there's actually a significant sports science community and endurance community on Twitter. Uh, got about coming up on 6,000 members there and, and uh, or followers, I think they're called. And, and then I'm on ResearchGate. So, and ResearchGate is, is if they want to read the geek actual research that I've done, the papers that are behind the presentations, then they can go to ResearchGate and get them for free. They can download them for free. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, it's transparent. We, the, the, and then there's, of course, there's lots of presentations and videos and stuff on, uh, and, and also some PowerPoint presentations that I've also put on ResearchGate. So most of the stuff that I know, you guys can know too by just going to either ResearchGate or or, the, or, or Google. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. This has been a mind-blowing episode for me. It's answered so many questions. And I know for sure our listeners are going to love this. So thank you very much. Well, uh, get you, back did to a, Norway. you did your homework, man. I'm impressed. Man, uh, I tried. I tried for sure. So uh, have a great uh, have a great day. And I think we're interrupting your stage seven of the tour. So. Yeah. So I've got to go check out who won. All right, man. Take take care and thank you so much. You bet. Bye. Right. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to listen to episode fourteen, where we interview Nate Pearson from Trainer Road to learn how his experience racing Leadville can help you go faster at your next ultra endurance event. If you enjoyed the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, 
please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L-O-C-Y-C-L-I-N-G.com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe.